It's time for a questions and answers video answering questions that were asked in the comments of a recent question and answers video. And while I'm doing it, I'm going to be demonstrating just how boring it is in real life uh, working on the electronics behind props for television and film because I'm going to be making a loom up for a theatre presentation and it's going to involve lots of repetitive work. So let's start with these wires that are solid core wires that I'll be putting crimps onto. For those of you wondering if you can actually put crimps onto solid cores, I looked at this through a magnifying glass. I even took a picture of it, but uh, it's very grainy. And when you actually use this crimping tool and it curls the uh, wings of these crimps down into the wire, with the solid core wire, it actually indents right into it, it actually cleaves into the wire. So it does seem to provide good solid connection. It's what I'm going to be doing. First question. JC Lowe asks, could a neon tube glow when near an ozone generator? Well, I suppose it depends on the ozone generators. Some, some of the really old ones in the past were literally pairs of neon tubes connected to a high voltage 50 or 60 hertz transformer just in the vicinity of each other. This is a standard uh, Draper NOWS6 uh, wire stripping tool I've got here. Just a generic fixed size stripping tool. But in reality, uh, most ozone generators don't create a super high, well, a high voltage radiated field. It's usually enclosed across the plate or the points that generate the ozone. So it's doubtful that you could make a neon tube glow uh, with an ozone generator. You could always try it. The high voltage supply inside could power a neon tube though. I'm just stripping all these wires. See, this is this is what I mean. It just it's very time consuming. It just it eats time. But the end result is usually worth it. Next question. Echelon Rank says, stop eating trashy food and drinking junk. Well, uh, I don't really I do drink in the live streams, uh, and the food isn't really what I'd call... I'm not a meat and two veggie types of person. I'll eat tins of, like, macaroni cheese or ravioli and stuff like that, or noodles. I'll eat porridge in the morning. The food is relatively healthy in that respect, but uh, being sort of technically inclined, I could happily live off generic astronaut space food, you know, just little sachets of paste that you, that had a theme and it was just all your nutrients combined into one. I'm not really too fussy about food. Almost near the end of the first batch, there's 20 of these uh, wiring arrangements being made. And there's, for each one, there's a green and a brown core. The reason for the green and brown is that these are the Branches of a plant that will be dropping petals. If you want to see the prototype of the prop, uh, just look up. Uh, I can't remember what I called it, but it was basically, it was a an experiment at something for Beauty and the Beast that would actually drop the petals on cue. And uh, it's very simple. The approach I took was to attach the petals onto resistors plugged into connectors with uh, a blob of wax. So that when you turn the power on, after a short time delay, it just gently flops down and then it drops. There's a video specifically about that. In comes the next bunch of wire. Tries to pull an LED in with it. Um, tries to pull lots of stuff in with it. This is the peril of lots of loose wires at your bench. I'll try not to poke them into live terminals in the process. And I shall keep stripping them and answering questions. So I'll get into the swing of stripping these first. Next question. Melted Camera asks, what is something that you really want to learn or expand your knowledge on? Um, I'd like to get more comfortable with welding, the different styles of welding, not just sort of MIG and ARC, but actually TIG as well with different materials. Ideally, I'd want to master welding aluminium, but that is quite a complex thing. It also requires specific welding equipment because with uh, welding aluminium, you really have to have a welder that can pulse, alternate the polarity on the tip of the welding rod because ultimately, uh, it, the, on one, the oxide causes huge problems electrically by forming a, an insulation layer, aluminum oxide, and also a thermal barrier. So really, that's why aluminum is so rugged. It's that oxide layer on the surface. 
And uh, when you change the polarity, it actually cleans the surface and then it welds it and then it cleans the next bit and welds it as it goes along. So that's something I'd really like to get more involved with. And if everything goes to plan, if I get the workshop I'm looking for with more space and less stuff to go on fire in the vicinity, then that will be an option. The aluminium is also a very difficult uh, metal to weld because of the heat. You have to vary the power uh, as you come in from one end and then peak the power in the middle of the weld and then tail off it then because uh, there's less, at the ends there's less uh, heat dissipation through the aluminium because it's a uh, less surface area being, uh, that the heat can be taken away. But then that also depends on the depth of the aluminium. It's a complex subject, that's why I'm kind of interested in that one. Welding stainless would be quite good as well. But that's easier. Especially with TIG. Right. That should be all these wires stripped. Now I get on to crimping. And more questions. So the connector I'm using is my favourite connector. I often refer to it as a Molex connector, but in reality it's not a Molex connector. The online name is KF2510. KF2510. And it's a tenth of an inch pitch connector. Very common. This particular batch that came through has really easy to separate contacts. They come in a strip. Normally, if you buy these connectors from, say, a supplier like RS Components or Rapid Electronics, you buy just the shells, but then you have to buy strips of the contacts as well. In the case of Rapid, I think they, they just sell them in rolls now. I'm not sure. That's where I usually get them from, but they don't do the black ones. The black ones came from an eBay seller. Next question. Jeremiah Fieldhaven, where do all the calculators go? Well, I'm supposed to say Silicon Heaven here. But in reality, people hoard calculators. They can't let go of them. They have favourite calculators, and even though they get a new one, they will hoard the old one. Olifan37, what do you call an adjustable wrench here? I would call it, and this might not be typical, it's just the company that I serve my apprenticeship with called a shifter. I'm not sure why they called it a shifter. I suppose it's because it shifts things. And the electrical industry would be used with violence to shift things. Right, tell you what, we're on to crimping terminals now. So here's my crimping tool from Rapid Electronics. It's not an eBay special. So each terminal gets placed in, uh, closed down a bit. The wire gets tucked in with just enough to, for the insulation to actually be caught and then crimped. It's very much a touchy-feely by feel thing, but that's one terminal done. So let's uh, just keep plodding my way through these. Load the crimp in and crimp it. Very, very time consuming. Immediately thinking of uh, productions I worked on for a company called The Quickening, uh, where because it's easier for me just to make the wiring looms up and all the circuit boards for the props and then just hand them to the prop maker so they can build them in when they want to. Uh, it meant that everything had to be done as wiring looms and I'd spend entire evenings at my bench just making huge wiring looms with all the sort of tails coming out of them and then send a drawing in with the guys to tell the guys where everything plugs together and then everything just went together on set. If it was a big production, I would often give them spare wiring looms so if anything went wrong at all, they could just plug a new loom in. And it meant I didn't have to be there on the set because uh, that is just a very boring thing. Might sound glamorous, might look glamorous, isn't glamorous. It's just very, it's a long day. But having said that, uh, working on the set, getting them all built up in the first place is quite fun, particularly those with a sci-fi theme. Let's just grab this green wire since it's in the way. Next question. Bat Dragon 71, when is your shop going to reopen? Okay, I've got a website shop, just a page on my website that I used to sell circuit boards and kits on. I don't have the full range of stuff like uh, some of the more recent circuit boards. I've just put the files up because... Ultimately, the Postal Service, something happened. In the Trump era, uh, Donald Trump did something to the Postal Service in America, whereby the Postal Service started charging for parcels coming in. It was a wee go at China. Unfortunately, it also had a go at the rest of the world. 
And uh, because of the increased charges in processing, the Royal Mail responded in the UK. Also, this happened round about COVID, which is just terrible. Uh, they responded by adding on the cost for the, the... America ended up its own little price of chart with astronom astronomical prices, and then they marked them up further because they... Uh, were struggling to ship stuff during COVID. It was costing them a lot to ship stuff. So they handed that price on to at the same time as the Trump addition was made. And it resulted in the most convoluted, most complicated system that even the smallest little package would cost a fortune. And there were significant price differences be between sending everything in one box or sending lots and lots of little packages all with their own label and stuff like that. It's just turned into a nightmare. It is so hard sending stuff to America, I've just stopped. It's not nothing against Americans. It's everything about both the Royal Mail and the what the USPS did. They messed up the postal system royally. And it's just made life difficult for people selling stuff online. I could open it up again, the shop. I could just say, to rest of the world only, but not America. It feels like I'm discriminating against the Americans. But unfortunately, that's what might end up happening. Um, or I could add an auxiliary postage charge to the Americans, but they probably wouldn't like that because it would be huge. It's just really messed up at the moment. This is what happens when multiple layers of bureaucracy get involved. But that will resolve itself at some point, I'm sure. Maybe. In the meantime, if you like the circuit boards, all the files are on my website. You can go and you can download the Gerber files, well, most of the files, the circuit boards, and you can get a batch of five made uh, in China and shipped to you in America for less than I can uh, get them manufactured and shipped just one. Because postal services, bureaucracy, that was a mini rant, wasn't it? Next question, getting away from that rant. Dystopian paradise, first major shock and most pleasurable. What's that question? Is that most pleasurable? My first major shock, I've often mentioned this, was in a supermarket on an automatic barrier gate that had been serviced. The control box I was fitting had been serviced by someone who wasn't really very competent. And they'd missed off spacers. They'd missed off the nylon spacers that uh, separate it the circuit board from the metal case, but they'd also missed off the brass spacer that earthed the metal case from the circuit board, which was the main connection point. So the case was unearthed. As I pulled the control module out, the circuit board got pulled against the case, but only as soon as the wires had a bit of tension on them. And in front of all these people, I was given a full a hand-to-hand, -hand, across the chest, womp electric shock. And it was my first major electric shock. And Jeez, oh, trying to maintain your dignity when that happens is really not fun. Uh, and then you have to kind of recover from it, and like the barrier gate was closed, I had to open it. Uh, but the thing was potentially alive because of what had happened, and so I had to climb up the ladder and uh, disconnect the spur that fed that gate. Uh, then come down and pull the gate open so people could go through and then slump down behind the gate. Yeah, it was joyous. And then the first person that went through, a fat lady, leant over and said, you got a shock, didn't you? And I was like, mm -hmm. it was very embarrassing. A most pleasurable shock. I won't lie. Uh, when I've been testing how much current I can with hand, <laughs> withstand and passing electrical current through myself in a controlled manner with resistance in series, there is a certain level, just about the 4 milliamp level, that is actually quite a nice sensation. Is that weird? Yes, it is. Oh, well. Did I mention how boring this, uh, this task is? It's, I suppose ultimately it's not boring if you're listening to me chatting and, and ranting. Next question. Uh... Kiba Wolf, my impression of the furry community. There are a lot of furries that watch this channel. The reason for that is because a lot of the people who do the furry fandom thing, that's the people who dress in the mascot style suits, for those who don't know. Uh, a lot of them are super technical, geeky people. And I get the feeling it's that classic thing. It's a little twist of autism that they're basically, they're so shy in real life 
that uh, they kind of have an alter ego in their fursuit. But they're usually extremely technical, but I've got the opinion that most fursuits have an engineer inside. Like, engineers with fairly high profile jobs and interesting, yeah, interesting careers. And like, fairly prominent technical skills. Just seems to be that sort of weird thing. I'm going to have to turn the page over. I'm on to the next page of questions. Tom Miller says NTC for a 2000 kVA, 240, 210 volt sight transformer, right? That's 2 kVA, by the way. That Not 2000 kVA. That would be 2 megawatt. That would be really, that would be very heavy. So in the UK, we have building sight transformers. The building sight transformers, uh, are basically a yellow box with a handle on top and they convert 240 volts down to 110 volts center tap to ground so it's 55 volts either side and it's considered a safe voltage you know there's less risk of electric shock um, but they because they're basically big transformers uh, potted in resin they tend to have quite a high inrush current and this causes problems with type B in particular circuit breakers tripping when you plug them in so adding an NTC inrush limiting resistor is actually a good idea, but I'd recommend getting ceramic terminal block for that because they can get hot. Uh, well, they, they rely on getting hot. That's how they work. They start off with a fairly high resistance, then they heat up and it, the resistance goes down. But they do run warm. Uh, and it might be, poss might be better. You don't have to take much of that current spike off. So you can use a fairly low resistance one. But they, they tend to be rated on the diameter of the disc and the current they're designed to handle and their, uh, and their uh, start resistance. Don't be too greedy and go for a massively high resistance because it puts a lot more strain on the uh, NDC inrush limiting thermistors. They're the little black discs that you see often inside. I'm just trying to see if I've got one handy here. Have I got one handy here? Yeah, that little black disc tucked in between the capacitors where it's out of sight. That is an NTC inrush disc, but they, they do them in quite big sizes. And uh, if you put one of those in a ceramic turner block in series with the transformer, when you first turn it on, it will take away that initial zap. It will put a resistor in series briefly. And that can stop the circuit breakers tripping, which is useful. Ah, the glamour of showbiz. Definitely not as bad as many of the wiring looms I've made, though. This one only has about 40 tails to be made. Next question. Eric Zweiger says, I worked with an electrician who would test live circuits by licking his finger and thumb and holding the bare wires. Now, as you get, if you work in the construction industry or engineering, you tend to have quite thick skin. You end up with just a thick, hardened skin layer. Uh, mine is not so thick these days. I must be leading a pampered life, but it used to be very rough and hard to the point it used to snag in some materials. And if you've got that thick skin, the layer of dead cells will limit the current through you. But although it used to be fairly common practice and in the first electrician's guide that was ever printed, the first guidebook, they actually said, you can sense when electricity is there by holding a wire and you will feel a strong tingle from the wire. In reality, they removed that very quickly because it turned out the difference between a strong tingle and sudden and violent convulsing death isn't really that much when you're using your bare fingers. Because, uh, as you may have seen the recent spam electrocution video I did, uh, the juicy meat inside you is very, very conductive. And the only thing that's insulating you in most instances is the environment you're in and the layer of dead skin cells in the front. If you lick your fingers, that's making it worse. I'm guessing that guy was in a fairly isolated environment, but you can't always rely on that. If you got used to just dabbing wires and feeling if they were tingly or not, you might do it while outdoors standing in the wet and that would suddenly be a terrible experience. Water and ground, coupling you to ground makes a massive difference. Even wet wood or concrete makes a massive difference. So uh, I don't recommend doing that. The old timers did it. 
for reference, some were saying that their uh, dad used to um, test wires by touching them and uh, then say, oh, I suppose you better turn the power off so nobody panics. Uh, but so despite the fact he deliberately gave himself shocks, this used to be really common, uh, he lived till the age of 99. So that kind of hints that uh, the odd electric shock isn't necessarily harmful. I mean, that's just maybe just a coincidence. I don't think it will increase the length of your life, not really sure. That's down to genetics and eating habits. Oh, we're back to the eating habits again. Next question. KJ asks, do I play video games? No, I don't. I just know time for it. Uh, I know a lot of people spend a lot of time playing games. June of the NBC plays games a lot. I just don't have the patience or time to actually uh, get into games. But occasionally, I'll look at some of the gameplay on YouTube. And particularly once when things go wrong, I'll marvel at the extent the software has evolved. Because the software is absolutely spectacular these days. The environments, well, it's games have all, always driven uh, the progress of computers. The reason we have super high power graphic cards is because of games. And that's also why the computers run at such high speeds. I don't even know what the current typical speed of a modern computer is these days. Probably a lot more than my first computer, which ran at something like 25 or 40 megahertz. I guess they've evolved somewhat. They're well into the multiple gigahertz these days. Probably. I don't know. I just not checked. I do not have need for a high power computer for designing circuit boards and writing software and stuff like that. Or just browsing the internet. I use a Chromebook for that. Next question. How do you control the zoom of your camera? I'll tell you what, I'm just going to grab a camera and show you. Here's the camera I'm using for the live streams. Uh, open camera. The colour's going to be all skewed. Uh, swap that round. Uh, to zoom, I enable the little zoom slider here on the side. And a lot of the secret of this is the fact that ultimately, I have the camera here mounted on a fairly solid bench so that I can actually zoom in and out without you actually seeing the camera bouncing up and down a lot. It's all about mounting the camera rigidly and most shitty tripods don't do that. I shall put that out to the side. I just showed you a nice picture of my ceiling with uh, acoustic foam pads on it. I don't know if they really helped or not. How's the time here? 22 minutes and 54 seconds. I won't go too long with this, uh, partly because I'll run out of questions and it really is just me doing this and I'll be soldering connectors afterwards. That's it. It's a very repetitive thing making looms like this. The same thing for the guys that are molding lots and lots of props. They make, they sculpt one master and then it's all about uh, casting the other ones in resin in the molds they make. The prop industry seems glamorous from outside partly because it's connected to films and stuff like that, but in reality, it's not that glamorous. Like the lighting industry as well, it's ultimately, when it comes to crunch, it's a, a truss with lots of fairly similar lights on it, all being addressed. The only thing that's really different between them is the styles of lights and addresses. And then just being on standby once you've hung them all to fix things when they go wrong. Hopefully not in the middle of a show, which puts a lot of pressure on you. Next question. Uh, the electronic guy, what was the most dangerous situation for, me, for you? Maybe I don't know the most dangerous situation. Maybe it, because it didn't happen, it wasn't, it wasn't known. I just smacked the camera with the bar there. But the most dangerous one that I know of, the biggest F up I did was working on a compressor pack, a refrigeration compressor pack, and you couldn't isolate the whole thing, so I had to isolate one compressor in it for disconnection because we we're changing the compressor. Big car engine sized compressors. And uh, I was tired, very noisy room, sweating a lot because it was just like, yeah, just a very loud, noisy, hot room. 
overalls soaked in sweat lie across the top of it because the whole all the compressors, which were hot, uh, to gain access to a poor access location. And I tried the my deep socket for size on the terminal of the compressor I was about to disconnect because the one I'd isolated and it turned out I hadn't isolated it. And I put it on uh, and it fitted and just right at the point I took it off the terminal, the phase terminal, holding the metal ratchet, just at the point I cleared it, the compressor suddenly went bump and it started. That would have been possibly terminal if I'd... Uh, that would have been like nobody would have heard me. I don't think I would have been able to scream if something like that had happened because... Uh, Current would have been flowing through me at considerable volume. A wake up call to double check every time. And also keep double checking when you're working on things because just because uh, you've isolated a compressor doesn't mean it's been wired correctly and it may have other control circuits running through it. This, the health and safety executive's lockout tag out before working is gibberish in many applications. It doesn't work. But I suppose it ticks their box and that's all they're interested in. Uh, next uh, question. I bet Clive works on alien technology but doesn't discuss it, says Great Lord Pooh. Well, I obviously couldn't discuss it if I did work in alien technology because my alien masters would then punish me. Sometimes I feel like I'm working on alien technology, particularly when you see some of the weird crap that comes from China. Hmm... That is all the wiring room is made. So that will end this section of the questions and answers. I may make another section when I solder things together, but I don't think it'll be very long, because I don't think I've got that. I think I've got one page of questions left. So uh, I shall end this video here. Uh, that's how exciting it is, working in the prop industry for real, and wiring up all the looms for LEDs and uh, other components. That's uh, a little taste of reality.